Good morning and welcome to the worship of God. It's good to be with you all once again. Happy Valentine's Day to you all. This coming Wednesday, Ash Wednesday, marks the beginning of Lent, the period of reflection and preparation leading up to Easter. Lent, I looked it up, is an old English word meaning lengthen. It comes during the time when the days begin to get longer. So next Sunday is the first Sunday of Lent, and we're organizing a series of five weekly Lent gatherings, beginning next Sunday evening at 7 o'clock, 7 p.m. on Zoom, running through until Sunday 21st of March. They are open to anyone who wishes to come along. We're going to be using the excellent uh, Lent study material based on Henry Nouwen's reflections on Rembrandt's painting, The Return of the Prodigal Son. We reflected on that painting and drew on Henry Nouwen's uh, excellent insights during our recent series of sermons on Jesus' parable of the prodigal son. To be sent a Zoom invitation link, contact me or Sheila. If you are at the live service, a button should come up now and at the end of the service so you can uh, ask for an invitation for the Zoom meeting. So that begins this coming Sunday, 21st. February at 7 p.m. All welcome to come along if you can. As usual, remember the after service, coffee and chat. Uh, if you're watching live, if you're on TV at Online Church, just watch for the button coming up uh, at the end of the service. Otherwise, use the Zoom link that was posted on the church Facebook page. Our call to worship this morning is from Psalm 18. Let's say these words together. You, Lord, keep my lamp burning. My God turns my darkness into light. With your help I can advance against a troop. With my God I can scale a wall. As for God, His way is perfect. The Lord's word is flawless. He shields all who take refuge in Him. For who is God besides the Lord? And who is the rock except our God. Amen. Our opening praise is the Lord's My Shepherd, Stuart Townend's arrangement of the 23rd Psalm, led for us here by Stuart Townend at the Keswick Convention. So let's praise God together.
Let us pray. Lord God, our loving Heavenly Father, we bow before you in worship together in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. The psalmist says, Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. How we praise you for your love and all the ways it enters our lives. Out of your love you brought everything into being, and you made us, giving us this wonderful gift of life. In your love this world is sustained in perfect balance. In your love you make the sun to shine and the rain to fall on everyone. For all the good gifts of your love, food, clothes, shelter, warmth, our families and friends, and all the good things you give us, we thank you. We recall and give thanks to you for the sustained good weather, the sunshine and heat during the first lockdown, and we thank you for the beauty of the snow during this current lockdown. Most of all, Father, we praise you for your faithful love in Jesus Christ, your Son, which never fluctuates or terminates. He loves His church and gave Himself up for us to make us holy, so we can be presented to Him at the end as a radiant church, holy and blameless before You. We, fa we thank You for that glorious future hope and for Your faithful love at work in our lives to bring it about by Your Word which is flawless and by Your Spirit who pours Your love into our hearts. We thank you for the love we share in our life together in your church, which means so much to us. Lord, because of your great love, we are not consumed, for your compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Father, we ask your deep blessing upon us as we gather together this morning. Assure us of your love in Jesus Christ, your Son, draw us close to You. We ask for Your forgiveness for those things in our lives that displease You. As we confess them to You, may we know that You forgive us and make us clean, as You promised to do through Jesus. Lord, please speak Your Word deep into our hearts this morning. Hear us as we speak to You in prayer from the depths of our being, and may we be able to praise You wholeheartedly and respond to you in deeper love and obedience. We bring our prayers in Jesus' name and continue in the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the power, the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our Bible readings this morning are read for us by Ian Landles and Pat Sutherland. Today's reading is from Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 to 25. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them, and whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, 
and they felt no shame. Amen. Our second reading this morning is taken from Matthew chapter 5, verses 31 to 32. It has been said, Anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, makes her the victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Amen. And may God bless his word to our hearts. Our thanks to Ian and Pat for these readings. We praise God now in the song, Faithful One, So Unchanging, by Brian Dorkson. This too comes from the worship at the Keswick Convention. Let us pray. Lord, we ask Your blessing now as we come to Your Word. May we hear You speak, Lord Jesus, 
and may you take this and work in our lives in accordance with your truth and your grace. We pray. Amen. She was devastated when he left her. She came home to discover the note on the table that he was leaving her. There was no mention of anyone else, but news came in coming weeks that someone was staying with him. Total shock and hurt and grief, bewilderment with guilt and regret mixed in. Now anger rises too. And there, and there are the children as well. What's to happen to them? Such, in these inadequate words, is just one possible experience of the tragedy of a broken marriage. There are many other experiences, of course. There is the experience of the other party in the scenario I just described, who for whatever reason, and they can be complex as we know, has become involved with someone else and has left. Or perhaps there is no one else involved. They just want out. In other cases, love grows cold and husband and wife drift apart. One party to the marriage can change significantly through something that happens. Mental health issues or illness or accident and life becomes unbearable for the other party. There may be constant arguing, distrust, and strife. There can be neglect, or there can be violence or other destructive behavior which make it unsafe for the other party to be around. These and other circumstances are the painful experiences many people have, very real and deep. Indeed, some of us joining in here in this service today will have been through some of the very things I have been describing, or people close to us have experienced them, and we have seen what they have gone through. As we turn to this part of the Sermon on the Mount today, where Jesus talks about marriage and divorce, we come to this teaching shaped by the experiences we have had. We are also affected by the culture we live in. Our present society is not marked by a strong adherence to Christian sexual morality. Marriage is not the start of life together for the majority of young couples. Some will not get married. For those who do, it comes after a time living together when the couple decide they want to get married. And in some cases, that might be because a child is on the way or has arrived. We see this pattern in our own families and extended families and among our friends, and perhaps for ourselves. I'm always pleased to marry a man and woman who come in these circumstances, wishing to make the lifelong commitment of marriage as it brings the relationship into line with God's purposes. But the context we find ourselves in as a society where people have a sexual relationship with someone, or indeed more than one such relationship, before they settle down with the right person who they then might marry, makes the traditional Christian teaching about marriage seem very radical indeed. Marriage does not have the position it once had in our society. It's well illustrated by two statistics from 2019. The number of marriages in Scotland that year was the lowest ever recorded at 26,007, of which 912 were same-sex marriages. The percentage of babies born in Scotland in that year to those who were not married was 51%. That percentage has not changed for a number of years now. Another relevant statistic is that there were 7,380 divorces in Scotland in 2018-19 the first year which showed a year-on-year -year increase of around 500 since 2011-12. It will be interesting to see the figures in due course for 2020, given the impact of lockdown. The experiences we've had, the culture we live in, both of these affect us a lot. And so let's bear that in mind as we come to look at the truth Jesus brings us. 
I have to say I venture on this with trepidation. The whole area is so sensitive, complex. But I press on because, because what we are dealing with here is Jesus' teaching, not mine, not the church's, but Jesus' good teaching. This, along with all His other teaching, shows us what it, like, it, what it looks like to be His disciple. This is a description of life within His kingdom as a follower of His, with all the challenge that involves, the cost of discipleship. But it's all designed for our highest good, as by His grace alone we seek to live by faith in Him. We could have skipped this part of the Sermon on the Mount because of the sensitivity of the subject, but what would that have said about our attitude to the teaching of our Lord? Let's allow His Word to do its work in our lives as we humbly listen to what He says and try to understand and apply it. As well as the section on the Sermon on the Mount we are focusing on today, Jesus has more to say in Matthew 19 about marriage and divorce, and we need to take them both together. But here in Matthew 5, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus begins His teaching with the words, It has been said. And the words He then quotes are not directly from the Old Testament. They are based loosely on Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 1 to 4, but do not convey the actual thrust of that passage. Those verses envisage a situation where a husband divorces his wife because he finds some unspecified indecency about her. She remarries, and then the same thing happens again. Her second husband also dislikes her and divorces her, or perhaps the second husband dies. In those circumstances, these verses say, the first husband is not to remarry her, as that would be displeasing to God after the way he had, the man had treated her in the first place. That's the focus of the passage, not the divorce itself. It concerns the protection of the woman. But the teachers of the law seem to have become fixated on the process of the divorce mentioned here. Listen to how they've been stating it according to Jesus. Jesus says, It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. Their emphasis is on the bit of paper that makes a divorce legal and gives the ability to marry someone else. They are, in effect, looking for a way of reducing the demands of marriage. Before we look at how Jesus responds to this in Matthew 5, let me read Matthew chapter 19, verses 3 to 9. Some Pharisees came to Him to test Him. They asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Haven't you read, He replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female, and said, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let no one separate. Why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard, hard, but it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. The Pharisees asked Jesus, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? There were current at that time two divergent views regarding divorce held by two different rabbis and their followers. One of them, Rabbi Hillel, took a relaxed approach, arguing that anything displeasing, even the most trivial failure, like burning the dinner, as one of the examples given, was grounds, were grounds for divorce. The other rabbi, Shammai, took a rigorous line that the only ground for divorce was some grave matrimonial offense, something clearly indecent. So when the Pharisees asked Jesus a question, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason, they are testing him. They want to see where he stands. Is he a conservative or is he a liberal on matters of sexual ethics? It's all very contemporary. But see what Jesus emphasizes in his response. It is not divorce 
But marriage, he emphasizes. He goes deeper and further back. He talks about in the beginning and goes back to Genesis 2, to the passage Ian read for us. He goes back to God's original creation purpose, which was one man and one woman becoming one flesh in the lifelong relationship of marriage. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate, Jesus says. But the Pharisees come back with the same line of teaching that Jesus addresses in the Sermon on the Mount. Why then did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? They are, you see, fixated on the process of divorce. Jesus responds to them that this was not a command. It was a permission. It was a concession to the hard-heartedness of people. Our sin, sadly, requires the concession of divorce because we're hard-hearted towards others, towards each other. But he says it was not this way from the beginning. He takes them back once again, you see, to God's original good plan for marriage. And then he turns to his specific teaching about divorce and remarriage. In Matthew 19, he says, I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for marital unfaithfulness and marries another woman commits adultery. This concerns the party who initiates a divorce. Yes, a divorce can happen. That is permitted in this fallen world. But except in one case, which we'll look at in a moment, remarriage for that party will be adultery. In Matthew 5, Jesus says, But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for marital unfaithfulness causes her to become an adulteress, and anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. This concerns the other party to the marriage from the one who initiates the divorce. That other party, says Jesus, if they remarry, and whoever marries them will be committing adultery, except in the one case Jesus mentions. It's strong stuff indeed, isn't it? It's a high calling Jesus gives. But let's look at the exception Jesus gives here. Although it's not mentioned, in his teaching on marriage and divorce in Mark 10 and Luke 16. This clause is found in both Matthew 5 and 19 in all the Greek manuscripts of Matthew's gospel. It concerns the case of marital infidelity, pornea in Greek. It's actually a word that means some act of physical sexual immorality, and the new NIV translates it as that sexual immorality. It seems that Jesus is saying, that where one party has broken the marriage covenant by being unfaithful to their spouse, the other party, not the party that's been unfaithful, is free to remarry in that case. That is not mandatory. Reconciliation can take place even in such circumstances where such unfaithfulness has occurred. But if that fails, then remarriage on that basis, on this basis, would not be adultery according to what Jesus says. We need to note that the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 15, gives another exception, a specific one. Having restated the law's teaching regarding divorce, he then gives his judgment that where one party to a marriage comes to faith in Christ and the other party sadly leaves because of their spouse's new found faith, the believer is not bound in such circumstances, he says. That not being bound can be taken to mean that the believing partner is free to marry, free to remarry. As we can see, though, even with these exceptions, we have before us in Jesus' teaching an understanding of marriage that is strong and deep, a high view of marriage. So how do we respond to this? a few reflections on some implications of this teaching of Jesus. First, we need to share as Christians the same high view of marriage that Jesus had. It is to be honored and upheld by all of us, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health to love and to cherish. 
until we are separated by death, is a profound and deep promise, a high and holy calling. We need to pray for marriages, our own, if we are married, and that of others. Valentine's Day is a good day to do that for the protection of marriages. Secondly, we need to see that Christian discipleship is required within any marriage and through marriage difficulties. Think of the Beatitudes at the start of the Sermon on the Mount, the characteristics of the Christian being poor in spirit, meek, merciful, a peacemaker, and so on. They all need to be at work within us in our marriages. The cross-shaped Christian life is so relevant here. Chrysostom, the early Christian leader, wrote, For he that is meek and a peacemaker and poor in spirit and merciful, how shall he cast out his wife? He that is used to reconcile others, how shall he be at variance with her who is his own? And when things go wrong, we need to do all in our power to seek reconciliation. If that is at all possible, that may involve repentance and forgiveness and mediation, if it can be agreed to. Thirdly, when things go wrong, and sadly, a marriage ends, then God's grace is needed in abundance, as are the gracious prayers, support, and compassion of others to allow the parties to rebuild their lives. Someone wrote to me with these helpful words, what I have learned is that God loves me in my brokenness and that failing to live up to God's perfect standards for marriage is no greater a failure than any other sin. It took me a very long time to accept this because I more than anything longed for a Christian lifelong until death do us part marriage, and I felt ashamed to be a divorced person in the church. However, I rejoice that His love and grace are sufficient for all my needs and that the blood of Jesus my Savior washes away all my sins. Amazingly, I know His love more because of the pain of my divorce. Fourthly, there needs to be obedience to what Jesus teaches here for the Christian in terms of remarriage after a divorce, and that can be hard. And this is, but this is Jesus' good teaching in line with the high honor in which marriage is to be held, and much pastoral care is needed in the complexity of all of that. And lastly, if we have gone against what Jesus says, there needs to be repentance so we can find His forgiveness and restoration. And that can happen even if you're married again. It is not possible or right to undo things. But there can be even now, right in the middle of your current circumstances, God's forgiveness, freedom from the guilt of the past, and a new beginning. All of this needs to be worked out in the messiness and reality of our fallen world. It's all very real and complex, isn't it? But in this very challenging and sensitive area of life, remember that Jesus in His grace is always there for you. He is always faithful and true. He is the faithful husband who will never leave His bride. Through faith in Him and what He has done on the cross, we can find a way through the way of forgiveness, restoration, and the new beginnings that He brings. May God bless these reflections on His Word to our hearts. Let us pray. Lord God, our Father, thank You for every way in which You show Your love to us. You have given us our lives, 
and you have given us all we need to live. You have placed in our lives those who love and care for us. You made us to know you, and though we were separated from you by sin, you have restored our relationship with you through faith in your Son, Jesus, because of all he has done in his cross and resurrection for all he is. For your faithful love to us in him, we praise you. We delight, Father, in your amazing, overwhelming, redeeming love. May we live in your love always, and may our lives express your love to all those we know, those who know us inside out, and all we come in contact with in our lives. We thank you, Father, for the love we find in our families and our friends. And especially today on this Valentine's Day, we give you thanks for the love between a man and a woman and the high calling of marriage. Lord, please be with those who are married. Strengthen, guide, and protect them and their marriages in your grace and power. May their union, their marriage, speak of your love and reflect the love of Jesus for his church. Lord, please be with those whose marriages have ended through separation or divorce. Guide them and keep them in your ways, and may they know in line with what they need, your comfort and your forgiveness. Lead them on in your grace and goodness. And Lord, please be with those who have not married or are widowed. Guide them in their lives, and may they find satisfaction in you and in doing your will. May they know your loving support and enabling in everything. And now, Lord, in a moment of quiet, we bring to you our own challenges or hurts in this whole area of life, or the challenges and hurts of others we are thinking about. Father, we pray for those who are unwell in body or mind, at home or in hospital, those who are undergoing treatment just now, and those who have recently undergone treatment and are recovering. Especially bring before you today Clark Graham in his slow recovery from his serious injuries after his car accident. May he and all who are unwell know your presence with them, and may your power be at work in them. Please bring healing where that is your purpose. And for those for whom there is no betterness here, may the hope of the gospel shine in their hearts. And pray, Father, for all who grieve the loss of a loved one. We especially remember the families of Drew Jeffrey, Jock Carruthers, and Bill Trotter, whose funeral services are this coming week. May you be present at these services, Father, to comfort and to speak your word into the hearts of these grieving families. And now in a moment of quiet, we bring to you our personal concerns. Lord, please hear all our prayers as we bring them in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn is Love Divine, All Loves Excelling, words by Charles Wesley, and the tune is Blind Wern by William Rollins. comes once again from the worship at Keswick.
Now let's say the grace together. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. It's been good to be together with you all uh, once again. May God bless you in the week ahead.